Welcome to Wireless Future. I'm Emil Björnsson, and as always, I have Eric Larsson on the call. How are you? Oh, I am Emil. I'm good, thank you. Been uh, looking forward, as always, to recording podcast with you. Um, so, today is 27, is it? Yes, it's episode 27, and this is an episode where we have a guest with us. So it's Florian Kaltenberger from Eurocom, where he's an associate professor and also a board member of something called the Open Air Interface Alliance. So, Florian, how are you? Hi, Emil. Hi, Eric. Uh, I'm very well, thank you. I'm, I'm really happy to be in the show. I'm a, I'm a big fan. I, I listen to the, to the podcast uh, um, in my car uh, on the way to work. So, um, yeah, thanks for having me here. Yeah, and thank you for, for listening and to all the other people who are listening. We're happy that people are finding ways of listening to us as part of their daily life. So, uh, as I was indicating with this open air interface, I was thinking that this episode would be dedicated to air interfaces in, in general. So, let me kick this off with a question for you, Florian. What is an air interface? Well, the air interface is um, is simply, um, let's say, the, the the last mile of the of the of your mobile network. So it's the it's the the link uh, between your your base station, between your antenna and your and your mobile device. Yeah? And typically, um, that's something that is is standardized yeah? has been standardized uh, um, since uh, since two G basically, um, and and uh, Different generations bring different uh, different uh, technologies. So, for example, in 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 two uh, G, um, it was um, uh, GMS, GMSC um, that was the air interface. Three uh, G had wideband CDMA, four G had OFDM, and and five G um, again is 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 OFDM. So uh, there are then different types of air interfaces uh, and. Uh, if there are like two air interfaces with OFDM, are they the same, or, or there are multiple different standards to care about? No, so so there is uh, nevertheless uh, a big difference between uh, between 4G and 5G. I mean, based on but both of them are based on on OFDM, um, but um, the the there are significant differences such that uh, that uh, a chip that can do um, 4G does not necessarily know how to do 5G. Um, the other way around uh, might be might be possible um, because um, 5G in many ways is an extension um, to the to the 4G air 4G air interface. Hmm. Uh, so you, I mean, you mentioned modulation here, right? Like OFDM, but is does the air interface also consist of like other components, like oh, multiple absolutely. access and random access and so oh, forth? I mean, yeah, is, yeah, it, yeah. is it a correct understanding that the air interface is everything that happens like well <laughs> at the access point or i mean the bits come in in packets in some form right and then they are converted onto waves that are sent over the ether and and the air interface really comprises everything there modulation coding random access um and so forth uh is that like an accurate definition yeah yeah, yeah of course i mean there are um the there are multiple layers um, even in the even in the radio access network. So typically, you have the, the the file layer, the physical layer that takes care of the of the modulation and coding. Um, then you have the the Mac layer that takes care of of of, of multiple access between um, different users and also um, multiplexing between uplink and downlink. And then you have um, even even some more layers on on top, like the the, the RLC um, that also has another. Um, layer of, of, of retransmissions um, and the PDCP, which is then the interface to the uh, to the to the core network. Yeah, so all of all of these layers, of course, work together um, to ensure that uh, you have a, a reliable um, link on the on the radio interface. Mm. So, are all the components of the air interface standardized? I mean, if we take five G as an example. Um, is everything in there in the standard, or are there parts that are left to the implementation that, that the, the vendor can can decide this decide freely? Uh, absolutely, there 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 are certain parts um, that are um, not described in the standard um, that are actually not needed to be described in the standard. So let's take for an example the um, the channel coding. Yeah, in five G, 
In 5G, this is um, LDPC, uh, low uh, density parity check coding. So uh, the standard simply describes how to encode your data. Yeah? So, um, and this is basically everything you, you need to know. Then it's up to the, to the vendor, to the chip maker, um, to, to find an algorithm that, uh, that um, implements that, um, an, an efficient decoder. You know, that uh, with a, with a low error probability and with uh, with low energy consumption. Yeah, so these these parts are typically not not described in the standard. Right, but are performance requirements standardized? I mean, I understand that the choice of decoder isn't, or or the particular algorithm isn't specified in the standard. But does the standard specify something like, well, you got to be able to decode this code with this SNR and that this error probability or anything like that. Yes, absolutely. So, so that's uh, there. There are plenty of documents that uh, that uh, specify this uh, performance requirements. So, uh, 3GPP, who is the organization who, who does the standardization, um, they they even provide you with uh, with channel models um, that uh, that tell you exactly. So, in 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 this and that condition, um, you so with that channel and that SNR level. You need to be able to achieve um, seventy percent of the of the peak throughput um, for this type of of, um, of modulation encoding scheme. Mm. So it's so really that, like the the standard tells you what you should be what you must be able to do, but not necessarily how to do it. Exactly, exactly. Mm. Yes, the standard also specifies. Um, so that's actually new in in five G. The the, uh, the minimum amount of, of of receive antennas that you have to put in your um, in your in your handset. Um, well, no, I think it was already for, for 4G, they put two antennas and for 5G, this is now five, uh, four antennas. So these performance requirements, of course, take that into account. So, so you have to be able to achieve that with um, this amount of antennas, but nobody tells you um, you can put, uh, to put more, more antennas in the, in the handset if you, if you want to, to, make, to have even better performance than, than required. So you are involved in this Open Air Interface Alliance, which has a tagline "5 G Software Alliance for Democratizing Wireless Innovation." So, so what do you mean with that tagline, and what is the alliance all about? Well, so um, Open Air Interface. So the emphasis is on the open is is actually an an open source project. Yeah, so um, and it has been around for um, for a while now. Um, so it started even before I, I came to Eurocom, um, and back then, uh, so that was before the 2010s, before LTE, um, it implemented it already implemented 3G um, radio access. So you were able to um, simply using our code um, and um, and uh, using off-the-shelf equipment like um, like PCs and um, and software-defined radios. You can set up your own um, your own base station or your even a, a complete network um, that is that is compatible with commercial handsets and um, and thus have a, a test bed or even a, even a, a functional network um, to do to do experimentation and and since and and this continued so since ever since the the, the, the uh, beginnings um, open air interface has implemented uh, 4G 4G LTE. This was actually our first um, big success because that was that was um, when we had a um, complete chain that was compatible with uh, with commercial equipment. And um, and and since a few years um, we also have uh, 5G, both uh, 5G uh, non standalone and standalone. So. Yeah, and and um, as I said, the emphasis is is on on open because traditionally um, these these systems um, are closed. Yeah, so so I mean the the, the big companies that uh, that sell um, equipment uh, to to mobile network operators, um, they I mean their, their their revenue is 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 based on on patents essential patents they have in the standard. Um, so, I mean, they, they don't want to um, open up their, their algorithms. They don't want to show what um, what they have inside, and that's that's how they make make the money. Okay, but that that was always um, that was always a big burden um, for academia and and research, um, and um, 
and that was was the motivation why why back then um, my colleagues have um, have started to um, to provide an, an open source implementation of of this air interface so that other people can uh, can come and take it um, and and get an easy entry into this um, into this um, systems and and start setting up test beds and um, um, yeah and 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 do research. So then, in addition to Eurocom, which is obviously a partner in this alliance, uh, you also have some other sponsors and contributors. Uh, who are, are they and what are their sort of roles or interests in this project? Yes, um, absolutely. So um, a few years back, I think it was uh, 2014, um, we we started to... Um, um, to set up, so, so, so when when the when the interest really really increased, um, Eurocom was in a in a in a difficult position, and then we we couldn't manage the, uh, all the requests and and all the activity around it anymore. So we created this um, this uh, alliance called the Open Air Interface Alliance, which is a, a non-profit um, um, entity which is um, founded by Eurocom, but which is Basically, apart apart from Eurocom, and um, this uh, this entity um, is um, is is a so-called endowment fund. So we, it it um, is allowed to to receive uh, donations, and and these donations um, allow us in the allow us to to um, hire a, a team of of engineers um, to be able to to and managers to be able to maintain. Uh, the the code to to make sure that um, contributions to the code uh, fulfill certain quality requirements um, to have we have a certain um, quite a sophisticated uh, uh, continuous integration process meaning that that, that there is uh, testing for every code that is contributed there is there's testing and so there are, there are indeed there are a lot of companies who who have in, who have interest in um, in in Having such an organization um, running and, and ensuring the quality of the code, and um, for example, uh, so we have strategic members. Um, if you allow me, I, I I would like to list them. Yeah, please. Um, there's there's Orange, uh, so the, the mobile network operator Orange. Um, there's uh, Fujitsu, uh, equipment manufacturer. Um, there is um, Sequence, uh, another um, chip manufacturer here in in France. Uh, we also have Qualcomm. Um, quite uh, uh, quite happy to have Qualcomm on the on the board, um, who is quite a leader in in, in making chips for for five um, G handsets. Um, we have uh, Meta Connectivity, so formerly known as uh, as Facebook. Um, we have uh, Xilinx, the the makers of of FPGA. And um, another entity that is maybe not so well known, um, which is called Power, uh, the platform for advanced wireless research, um, which is um, an, an organization in the United States um, to, to build next generation um, advanced wireless um, uh, platforms. Hmm. That's a rather wide array, array of partners, uh, quite impressive indeed. So um, just so that, um, our listeners and also I will understand this properly. <laughs> um, so open air interface is mainly software. Is that right? Or do you also develop hardware? I mean, I think you mentioned that you could run open air interface on like pretty much any set of PCs and SDRs or software defined radios, but is open air interface the software only, or does it also have like hardware components that come with it? So, Open the interface is is only only software. So what the the alliance only manages the um, the software package. But of course, to to run um, open the interface, you you need hardware. You need um, um, I mean, typically um, it runs on on software defined radios. Right. Yeah. And so, so, but I mean, uh, what are the requirements on the hardware? Could anyone like download the open air interface and just install it onto some appropriate if you got some PCs in the garage and maybe some <laughs> software defined radios? And if so, what sort of software yes. defined radios do you need? I mean, is it like you can buy from 
uh, well, uh, many vendors, obviously, yes. but there are, there are a few that dominate the market, I think, for like academic and experimental research, right? You can buy like off the shelf. So could you run open air interface on those or would you need yes. like more specialized gear here? So, um, yes, you can um, buy these, uh, these devices um, uh, on the Internet. So the, the most popular software defined radio that, um, that is used with open air interface is um, the so-called uh, USAP um, that has been uh, designed by by Etos and is now distributed by by National Instruments. And um, I mean there are multiple generations of these um, these devices. And uh, well, depending on the on the on the um, generation you want to you want to use, um, you have different requirements on the on the hardware. So for 4G, you can use one of the older ones, um, for example, the P210s. Whereas for for 5G, which requires larger bandwidth, um, you would need to use one of the more recent um, N310s. Mm. So, so, but but really, it's like I mean, if you buy in principle, I mean, you could set up your own little 5G network that would be completely compatible with all the commercial handsets and and other commercial equipment by buying a bunch of these USRPs um, of the latest model and downloading and running the open air interface from your website. Is it like that? Um, yes, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's more or less that. I mean, there, there are a few other small pieces that you need. You need antennas and, and depending on, on which, uh, which band, um, which, which frequency range you want to, you want to do, um, you might need other equipment. So, for example, if you have, if you have TDD, um, then, then typically we, we you need a, a front end that, that that switches between the uplink and downlink, or in some cases a circulator would uh, would do too. Whereas uh, in FTD you might need a, an additional duplexer um, to to have a, a better um, performance on the on the radio level. Mm. Yeah, I certainly understand. I mean that there might be auxiliary hardware components required that don't come uh, a standard supplies with uh, the usrps but in principle i mean you could you could buy these components off the shelf and yes, a bunch of yes. usrps and then just yeah. set up and, and and run exactly yeah i mean you have um, of course um, also some requirements on the on the computing hardware i mean um, maybe the, the the laptop that you have lying in your garage won't fulfill those requirements anymore <laughs> so you need a bit of a um of a, of a PC that is more um, up to date, right? Um, but uh, yes, I mean, uh, in total, I think for uh, for a few thousand uh, euros, um, definitely less than ten, you can you can set up your whole five G five G system. Wow, that's quite amazing indeed. So, yeah. so what program, pro- programming languages are used here? I mean, how is Open Air Interface implemented? Um, so, uh, I would say ninety nine percent is uh, is C, so classic classical C, because we do um, we do. Um, try to optimize our code as much as possible, and we do actually rely a lot on on a, a specialized instruction set that you have on basically on every modern uh, modern um, um, chip. Um, so we use this vector processing um, um, instructions, SSE and AVX, um, to because otherwise you would never be able to run this uh, this thing in real time on a on a classical computing um, infrastructure so you mentioned earlier that uh, for the the conventional vendors uh, patents is a big thing for getting revenue so if i would now download and buy all this stuff that you mentioned can i just uh, and i would get the license of course for, for spectrum can I just run it, or do I need to get an agreement for in terms to licensing patents from the big vendors, yes, or how does yes. it work? Very good question. Thank you. Um, so, one of the contributions from Open Air Interface is also the the Open Air Interface um, 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 open source uh, license. Um, so, classical open source licenses uh, basically are not compatible with um, um, with patents so when you the meaning that that um, when you when you own a patent and you decide to implement the, the, the technology in open source and, and give it out in open source basically you you lose your rights to your to your patent with classical open source licenses um, and um, but we Basically, we, at the Open Interface, we wanted to, to to merge both worlds, and we created this uh, this uh, Open Interface license um, that allows you 
uh, exactly that that allows you to have a patent implemented in open source and uh, still uh, be able to to ask for for royalties for your for your code um, but that only um, comes into into play when you start using open interface commercially yeah, so when you when you go out there and and, and make a product um, for example a base station that has open interface inside and you sell this on a large scale then it would be your responsibility to to go to 3gpp um, and uh, and and figure out how to pay your license fees um, <laughs> to the um, to the other big players as long as you use open interface just for your own research um, and 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 in the lab and this is explicitly mentioned in the license um, you don't need to worry about that yeah um, so you can you can use it freely um, in your in your own research um, without having to pay any fees of course as you said before you have to make sure if you want to use it outdoors or with uh, let's say significant power that that uh, then you have to make sure you have a license for the frequency that you're using um, because uh, keep in mind that um, uh, 3GPP systems, uh, or at least the classical 3GPP systems, don't work in unlicensed spectrum, so they only work in licensed spectrum. So you need a, you need a license. So how advanced are these? I mean, test beds that you can build using our open air interface, and particularly perhaps the test beds that you are building at Euricom. I mean, do they support massive MIMO, for example? uh with lots of antennas or how or put it this way how many antennas can you equip your yes. test bed with and still yes. um, run it with open air interface yeah so of course there are there are limitations i mean to to to, to the approach um so having to run everything in in software um makes the entry barrier lower but uh, of course it's it's it is more complex and and um so we can't achieve the same level of performance as you would have with a with a commercial equipment, but we do support MIMO. Um, we have, um, um, I mean, for four G, we support up to two times two MIMO. Um, for five G, um, right now we have two times two MIMO, but going on to on to up to four layers. Um, we had uh, projects. Um, and and that, that's the, that's about as many antennas as we have also deployed here at uh, at Euricom in 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 our testbed. Hmm. So, so, so you aren't. I mean, if I understand this well, you aren't really at massive MIMO yet, um, right? I mean, uh, you said four streams of four antennas is quite far yes. from like maybe sixty four or like a hundred antennas. Uh, well, but um, no, but but uh, keep in mind that, that the number of layers is not the same mm. as the number of antennas. So, oh, no, so sure. we, we we did have we did have a project um, where we did massive MIMO. Mm. We had an antenna array of um, I think it was sixty four antennas. Um, that um, and and we were doing experiments um, uh, of of using channel reciprocity for for massive MIMO. Um, so that we have um, we have uh, we have done in the past. Um, and um, that was, I think, we managed to do up to up to two streams. So we were able to we were able to serve two users in in parallel um, with this uh, with this massive MIMO test. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that was my real question. I mean, I th so, so if I got you right here, you said sixty four antennas, but on, but only two streams exactly um, through spatial multiplexing. Um, right, and that is with TDD fully digital reciprocity based beamforming yes. then yes at the time it was uh, it was that yes uh, more, so, so more... where's the bottleneck here i mean what prevents you from well 64 antennas is still a lot right I yes mean, you, well you could benefit from more you can yeah. never have to few you can never like lose by having more antennas let's say <laughs> yes. but uh, wh where's the bottleneck in terms yeah. of supporting more streams i mean yes. if you were to go like to multiplexing 10 or 20 terminals at the time with open air interface is it just that well a standard pc that runs the software even though your algorithms are coded in in c and so forth it just aren't efficient enough yeah. to deal with all the data or could you shed so, some light on that yes so i mean there there, there are two bottlenecks um, um if if you implement your your massive mimo system a fully digital massive mimo system where you have uh, um, every every antenna is basically connected to an RF chain. You basically, uh, I mean, it's it's actually not a problem to set up um, 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 a test band to, to to connect multiple SDRs together um, to um, to have this kind of 
um, massive array. The problem is streaming all the samples um, into the host and processing all the sample into the ho in, in the host. Yeah? Um, because first of all, it's a, it's a massive amount of, 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 of data. So even for LTE 20 megahertz, if you have 64 um, channels, um, oh, yes. that's, that's, that's many, <laughs> many gigabytes per, per second that you need to stream into the, into the host PC and then you need, need to process. That's a lot. That's exactly. a lot, yes. So that's, um, that's the first bottleneck. And then the other bottleneck is on the number of, of, of layers. Um, so of course, the more um, layers you have, um, the, so your, your, your throughput um, or your, your channel, um, or, yeah, yeah, your throughput basically depends on the, on the number of layers. And um, since we do everything in software, even the channel decoding, so, so then, then the, the channel decoding basically becomes the bottleneck. You know, when you, I mean, we can't, um, to, today um, we, if, if you run the LDPC decoder in software, um, basically the, the maximum throughput that we can get is, is a few hundred megabits, megabits per second. Uh, um, and then, I mean, but, but that bottleneck could be overcome um, by, by techniques like like offloading the channel decoding to dedicated mm. hardware. You know, yes. there, there, is, there is dedicated hardware, FPGAs or others, that you can offload the channel decoding to. So that bottleneck could be overcome. And, yeah, certainly. Uh, I mean, I guess you could use hardware accelerators or offload some of the computations onto uh, supporting uh, other machines, or even just cut the bandwidth. I mean, if the goal is to use yes. demonstrate the use of many antennas, you could reduce on the bandwidth, and that would cut also the uh, amount Absolutely. of data you have you, to process. You, you could so. do that too. You could mm -hmm. do that too. Mm -hmm. Or um, the third option is also to... Um, and, and that's something we, we are, um, have been started to try recently, um, to use the um, um, technologies that have been specified by, by the ORAN Alliance. So um, to use a, a, a front hall um, in, instead of streaming the IQ samples um, basically one-to-one -one uncompressed to the, uh, to the host, um, you could um, you could do a little bit of processing in your radio unit, um, um, for example, the, the, the OFDM frontend, um, that allows you to compress uh, the data that actually goes into the host, and uh, and then um, you could process more antennas in the in the host. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always like to think that you'd like you probably want to move as much of the processing to as close as the uh, as, as close as possible to the antennas, right? Yes, but yes. at the same time, my impression has been that the philosophy behind open air interface that you you collect all the data to like a central place in a PC and then you do all the number crunching there, and this just makes it somehow. I understand. I mean, the, the computational challenge when you have a lot of antennas and, and high bandwidths, but in principle, you can run everything on a single. Um, on a single machine, right, uh, with efficient code in, written in C, and then, but 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 even so, you'll at some point hit the wall in terms of how much bandwidth you can support, and how many antennas you can support, and how many streams do you can multiplex, and yes. so on. Yes. Yeah. So great. So it seems like this open air interface was very early with uh, sort of using general purpose hardware you mentioned already in the FreeJ era. And uh, now there is a lot of talk about CRAN or Cloud RAN that you would be sort of splitting up and using general purpose hardware instead of, uh, of dedicated hardware for different kind of things. So now when sort of bigger vendors are actually supporting these type of things, does that make the sort of open air interface approach less relevant or? No, no, quite, uh, quite the opposite actually. Um... Because that that increased the the interest in open interface. Because we were um, one of the first ones that that actually um, you know proposed this approach to do everything in software. You know, before it was long before people um, started to, to to use the term uh, cloud run or or virtualized uh, virtualized run. And 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 I mean this is one of the reasons why why open interface became so popular because people. Um, see it as a as a as a tool um for for cloud run and and i remember one of the um the first um um basically use cases of open interface that was um that was done completely outside of 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 Euricom, 
um, was a demonstration um, by I think it was uh, China Mobile at the at the, at one of the uh, Mobile World Congresses where they showed a Cloud Run demo that was based on on Open Interface. Uh, that was um, oh I'm trying to remember, but that was um, definitely more than five years ago. Yeah, I think they were sort of publishing some papers about that they wanted Cloud Run almost ten years ago or something like yes, that. Yes, yes, and they were using Open Interface as as the first proof of concept for 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 this. Huh? Hmm. Yeah. So, returning, I think you mentioned earlier this Open Run. Um, could you elaborate a little more on like the relation yes. or how open air, could could open air, air interface benefit from open run or, or or vice versa or um so, how, do, how do you see the relation there and how do you see that particularly playing yeah. out like in the long term so open run um uh, let, let me just quickly explain is is a kind of evolution of the um, of this uh, of this uh, cloud run concept um and um Basically resulted in a in a, another organization called uh, Oran, simply, um, which uh, which produced a set of specifications that uh, that kind of standardize um, the architecture of an of an open run network. Um, and and the key concept here is that um, um, they they introduced a, a set of interfaces um, within um, the the existing specification of 3GPP. Um, that allows you to to separate certain functionality within the radio network, and 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 that further allows you to um, to to basically run most of the components um, of a of a radio network on general purpose um, hardware in a in a virtualized infrastructure. And um, as I was saying before, I think um, um, open open the concept of open run together with um, um, software, open source software like Open Interface, is is the perfect marriage. Yeah? So they they um, they they perfectly go together um, because Open Interface basically delivers the the software that allows you to run um, um, several components of an of an open run architecture in a in a virtualized environment. Yeah, but uh, but it's not it's not the same thing. So so the the Open in open run does not refer to the same thing as open in the open interface. So the open in open run refers to the to the open interfaces between the different components. The different components could still be closed, yeah? whereas in open interface it's really the the, the software is open. The so if you if you put if you put the two yes. together, you have basically a, <laughs> a double open uh, open <laughs> system. Yeah? Yes, but that's an important distinction, right? I mean, yes. open here means different things in the in the yeah. two different terms. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, and if I understood correctly, one of the goals with Open Run is also that you should be able to more easily buy different pieces of equipment from different vendors and know that they can operate well together. Exactly. Yeah. So, the, so as I said, they they, they try to reduce um, the amount of, of specialized hardware that you need. Uh, so basically, in an Open Run network, the only specialized hardware that you need is the is the radio unit, um, and and which is then connected over over frontal network to a, what is called a cent uh, sorry a distributed unit and a centralized unit and both distributed unit and centralized unit can be run on 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 software in a virtualized environment so um, it's basically a, a network function and and you could have um, you can buy this network function from one vendor and maybe the other network function from the other vendor and if they both um, um, adhere to the open run specifications they should work together so when it comes to, to open run, the thing that I come across mostly in my research is something called functional splits. Mm -hmm. And I think you were essentially talking about that a few minutes ago when you said that we can choose where we do the multi-antenna processing. Is it close to an antenna or is it at the centralized point? Maybe you can take an opportunity to, to explain what is a functional split and why are there like five different ones in no run? <laughs> yes. Um... So the functional split means um, that um, uh, yeah that, that basically you 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 cut the protocol stack of a um, of a, a classical um, base station a GNOB, um into into several functions uh, with well defined interfaces in between and um, and indeed at the at the beginning when 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 cloud run uh, when these concepts were being discussed there were um, a multitude of of different functional splits 
um, that are um, that are available. And um, so uh, only at the end, only a few of them, um, uh, I would say, are, are, are being used. So one of them is the split between um, the radio unit and the, and the so-called distributed unit, um, which, um, which is um, in all run called the, the 7.2 split, um, which, um, which means that, that you do the, the OFDM uh, processing, um, so the FFTs and the IFFTs in the radio unit, um, and, and only um, send the, the, basically the, 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 the subcarriers that carry data, the, the non-zero subcarriers, um, you send them over the, over the frontal uh, to the distributed unit. And then the other split that there is in, in ORAN is um, the, um, the, um, um, the F1 interface, which is the split between the distributed unit and the centralized unit. And as the, as the name suggests, um, the, the split has been chosen such that um, you, the, the, these, these units can be uh, geographically um, distributed differently. So you would have maybe a, a distributed unit function you would have close to the edge, so close to the um, to the actual to the actual base station, because all the time sensitive processing happens in there. And uh, and then you have a centralized unit um, which which doesn't do that much of a time sensitive processing, which has more of a of a of a control function, um, which um, um, could be. Um, in a data center which is far away from the from the edge, or um, or or could not, yeah, depends on your application. So so the the functional splits allow you to to adapt your network structure to the application. Yeah? If you want really low latency, um, then also on the user plane, then maybe the, the the centralized unit is also on the edge, and you you have an application server right on the edge. Um, or if 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 you want to just a mobile. Uh, broadband um, without low latency and and uh, for for things like like Netflix or others, then your centralized unit might be uh, might be in the core um, or or further from the from the edge. So I think uh, when it comes to the, this MIMO processing that we talked about before, if I understood correctly, there's like one split where you from the antennas will have to send, if you have 64 antennas, you need to have to send 64 streams of parallel uh, data down for further processing, while there's another split where if you the 64 antennas only carrying four layers of data, you only need to send four layers yes. because you sort of do that mapping. Uh, Yes, yeah. so so that's that's possible too. That's that's part of the Oran specification that that that, that uh, beam forming and or pre coding um, could also potentially happen in the in the radio unit. Exactly for that reason, so that instead of having to to transfer um, sixty four um, uh, you know the the IQ samples of, of sixty four antennas, you only transmit the IQ samples of your of your four layers. And um, and the, the beam forming and the precoding is happening in the in the radio unit. Mm. Yeah. So it offers considerable flexibility in terms of where the different operations are performed, and in terms of what data that is actually shuffled around on these different front halls and interfaces. Then, um, yes, exactly. It gives it uh, it it simply um, gives you great flexibility to. Mm to deploy your network for um, for different uh, for different scenarios mm -hmm. I mean for the... yeah so so I'm trying to summarize what I've come to understand about the philosophy behind open air interface here and I so it's one thing is the openness right the fact that you can download as open source the software and run it more or less on any equipment assuming it's like modern enough and um, yeah. Well, and um, the other philosophy, if I understand well, is that um, open air interface should run on general purpose hardware. Mm -hmm. So aren't there like drawbacks and risks to that? I mean, one could be power consumption, obviously, but I'm thinking more in terms of what, what, where the boundaries are in terms of what, of what you can actually achieve and what you can actually demonstrate. I mean... We talked earlier about like how many layers you could support and, and how many antennas you could support and 
at some point, I mean, just the fact that you're running everything on a PC and, and the, the CPU processing capability will be the limiting factor. Um, would you do you see here that you in the future would build like A6 instead or or FPGA or use FPGAs or do you in any way in let's say in retrospect regret a little bit that while well, we should have built this using a rack of FPGAs <laughs> rather than <laughs> running it on a off the shelf uh, PC no. or could you comment on, on like yes. how you see that both in, in terms of the history and, and also for future yeah. development no, uh, uh, first of all, there are absolutely no regrets. I think the the, the choices that we made were <laughs> were were good because one of the the I mean, uh, keep in mind um, the open interface was started um, um, by the research community and for the research community in the in the first place, and and um, we we still um, um, you know we, we still value that a lot and and um, and and this is still important for us. Um, and having having things also, I mean, having things on the FPGAs is, is is nice and and and, and good for um, for certain applications. But the gener in general, the, the the code needs to stay flexible. Be able to we need to be able to to adapt to, to changes in the standard um, easily. And I I also don't think it's um it's um I mean, open interface is not the. Um, 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 let's say the the, the the savior of all <laughs> of all um, uh, mobile <laughs> mobile networks. So so there there are limitations, and and I don't think uh, that uh, that uh, big mobile operators um, like Orange would would uh, all all of a sudden you know change the whole network to use open interface. Uh, that as you said will not be energy efficient, but um, there are use cases, and and especially with five G, a lot of these use cases are popping up. Where um, it is where this approach is is interesting. I mean, think about um, um, private networks. You know, five G. When five G was designed, um, people said we we need networks for for different um, use cases, and uh, and and a lot of them were were private use cases. For example, a, a factory floor um, where you have a, a lot of machinery that that needs to connect to the to the network, um, or or campus networks, and um, and uh, here, one of the main um, uh, drivers is the, simply the cost. Yeah? Um, I mean, building a private network with uh, the same equipment that uh, that you see in, on, in national networks is prohibitively expensive, and 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 there there's a real market opportunity also for for open interface to to provide a solution. Um, and 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 uh, build a, a private 5G network, maybe even on the on existing infrastructure. I mean, for example, here in, at Euricom, we have plenty of, of, of servers in our uh, server room that can run some of these um, functions of, of of our mobile network. Mm. So, in principle, I mean, are you suggesting that one could set up a private 5G network by downloading the open air interface and buying appropriate off the shelf hardware yes. and then just run it is it like stable enough for that i mean if you have um, like well there <laughs> we're, we're getting let's say we're getting there we're getting there so getting i there, yes. i haven't i haven't seen um, mm -hmm. um larger um or network let's say networks with more than two base stations that run that run open air interface um but but there are several ongoing projects that actually have have this goal um, and there are even some uh, some startup companies that uh, that uh, try to to build products based on open interface to full to fulfill exactly that uh, that uh, that gap to provide mm -hmm. equipment um, to build private uh, private 5G networks. Mm -hmm. And and is I that, think that, um, yeah. I think so. in in um, in a few years from now, maybe two three years from now, we will see. Um, I, I'm, I'm I'm positive that we will see such networks. Mm. Is that your long term? I mean, I said earlier that. Open Air Interface was developed was developed by researchers for researchers, right? And I understood that one of the goals was to also lower the barrier in terms of what you need to get started with experimental research and actually building a test bed, which is even 5G compatible here then. Um, but really supplying software for like commercial operation of a private 5G network is, is something else, right? So yes. um, where on that scale do you really position yourself and how do you see well, like op open air interface developing uh, in the future in yes. that regard? So I'm, I mean, um, 
personally, I'm a I'm a professor at Euricom, so my business is 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 research. Um, mm. um, but so and and I will keep on using Open Interface for my research. But I I, I absolutely see a potential um, for Open Interface to be used in, in commercial products, and and it is one of the goals of the alliance to to foster that to foster an ecosystem and to support startups um, who want to build such such products uh, so i'm um i'm not going to do that myself um but but uh, we we I, I would like to see that so so we are supporting startups um and other companies even larger companies who 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 want to do that and and yeah initially you said right initially it was Built for research, but but um, it, it has changed over time, and and I, I I really see the opportunity and the potential here for open interface to be used on a on a commercial scale as well. So you mentioned mostly then the air interface because we asked questions about that, but you also mentioned that we need a core network. Mm-hmm. And if I understood correctly, the alliance is also having some projects around the five G core networks. Yes. Can you say something about what are the goals there? Yes. Um, yeah. Exactly. Open interface. Uh... Uh, provides the the whole the whole value chain, let's say. The, so both uh, the the radio elements you need for the radio access network, and the elements you need for the for the core network. Now the core network um, um, is is a little bit simple in the sense that um, that um, uh, you, I mean, there, there's no signal processing happening there. So so the the, the requirements on the on the computing is is not that high. Um, so naturally, it can run in a, in a virtualized environment on on, on classical um, on classical hardware. But yes, Open Interface provides, um, in fact, both the solution for 4G uh, core network and for the for the for the 5G core network, um, um, or let's say at least the the basic elements that allow you to to set up the network. I mean. Um, there are many things that you can do in the core network, like, um, for example, we don't provide things like uh, like an entity that, that provides you with billing capabilities. Yeah, that's not uh, interesting for us. Um, but the basic elements to to connect the mobile handset to the network is are there. So you mentioned that you are using this in your own research. Can you say something about what uh, you are doing more specifically recently? Um, so yes. Um, I mean, my I like like you, Emil and Eric. I come from the um, background of, of multi antenna um, communication, so I did a lot of uh, work on, on on MIMO in my in my PhD and in my my early research days. Um, and I was um, um, and I used Open Interface a lot um, to do research on on reciprocity based um, um, massive MIMO. Um, I also did some um, um, some experimental research on uh, on distributed massive MIMO, um, and um, yeah, more more recently, um, the research uh, focus has has uh, shifted a bit. I'm uh, um, I'm I'm uh, these days I'm I'm looking at um, um, uh, actually. Evolving from that um, from from that research, I'm I'm looking at uh, things like uh, like positioning and and localization in uh, in 5G networks, which is something which is very important um, for um, for especially private 5G networks. Yeah? I mean, I mentioned indust- in industry for zero uh, use cases. They they want the precise positioning indoors, which you can't really do um, with with um, um, equipment that you can with with 5G equipment that you can buy today. Um, so um, I'm, I'm looking at how to use uh, 5G networks or the signals in 5G networks to do uh, positioning and, uh, and and localization. So if we look into the future, then how do you think air interfaces will change over the next five, ten years? And, and people who are starting to get involved into research towards uh, yeah future of 5G or or 6G, how could what should I expect is going to change, and is open air interface sort of a research platform also towards the future? Yes. So um, I have to say I'm not I'm not a very uh, big uh, big visionary. Um, so uh, I, I I having a hard time. I mean I had a hard time uh, imagining 5G when mm. when people were um, talking about 4G, and now I'm having a hard time imagining what 6G will be like. <laughs> um, but I think um, I think it uh, it it. Uh, 
it will be more of an evolution than a, a revolution. Um, and uh, I, I think, um, I mean, five, the, the, what, what has been specified for 5G is a solid basis that, uh, that uh, is extensible, um, extendable also for, um, for the next generation. But um, I mean, if I listen to others, then um, what, what comes up uh, a lot is, is um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I think even, even in 3GPP, they have started to create um, a study item now, um, how, how, um, you know, how, how this could be included in the, in, in the standard. So um, I, I think we'll see some, uh, some of these, these elements uh, there. Um, um, and, and yeah, we, I mean, we definitely, um, uh, 6G will, will, I mean, in, improve uh, on the, uh, on the number of antennas and, and the processing and, and, and some things. Um, and I, I think that, that open interface will be, um, will be also a tool that, that, that allows you to do research in, in that direction. Mm. Yeah, indeed. Very impressive. And, uh, um, found it really interesting to learn more in depth about what you've been up to and uh, um, who are really like your main competitor here i mean <laughs> in this space of test beds and uh, let's say platforms that you can some closed maybe some open right yes, but, yes. i mean obviously there are lots of specialized test beds that have been built for a specific purpose i'm thinking for example of the lumami test bed that was developed by lund university uh, in the fp7 mammoth project to demonstrate reciprocity based um, massive MIMO and TDD uh, with spatial multiplexing and all that um, and that was built I think from mostly uh, user P equipment uh, along with some custom built hardware of course mm -hmm. and uh, then there are also um, test beds um, well, USRPs to start with, I mean, are rather capable, right? I mean, if I understand well, you can connect them together and you can do MIMO and you can do all sorts of things. So um, um, from an open air interface perspective, uh, who would you say is your closest or <laughs> worst <Yes>. <laughs> competitor? <laughs> um, yeah, so they're... they're um, so let, let's talk about the, 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 the software first. Um, so, of course, there are other projects that use um, um, software to, or that who implement um, 3GPP functions or, or entire base stations in, in, in software. Um, I think the most known is, uh, is basic is, is Amarisoft, um, which is, which is also a, a French company. Um, but they're, they're, I mean, their their concept is is pretty much the same, um, but their the business model is completely different. I mean, that's it's it's all closed source, um, and um, and basically it's a it's a I mean a, a for profit um, um, business um, who who's trying to sell um, their their product to to customers. And um, and on the open source side, there there are other competitors as well. Um, there is, um, um, I think. Um, uh, I mean, it used to be called SRS LTE, um, but they changed it to SRS RAN because now they also do um, 5G, um, which is um, um, similar in, in scope. Um, they use a different open source license. They use a, a GNU um, general public license um, version 2, I think. Um, and on the, on the core network side, the, the number of competitors is, is, is even higher. Um, there is a project called the 5GC um, or Open 5GS. I mean, there, there, there are plenty that um, um, that provide uh, core net core network functionalities um, in 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 open source. Um, but the the let's say the distinguishing characteristics of Open Interface is that it's the the only project that uh, that is uh, that provide that is open source end to end. Let's say uh, so from the core network. Um, even down to the uh, to the user equipment, we have we have implementation of the user equipment uh, too. So it's the, it's the most complete, and also as I mentioned before, it's it's quite un the, the open source license that we have is is, is quite unique. Mm. So that's really the unique selling point here, if I understand you well, that you have this openness in terms of the software license. You have this 
capability of running on general purpose off the shelf hardware and your implementation covers the entire chain yes. um, from the core network down to the air interface including also device implementations yes. exactly. very impressive indeed <laughs> yeah <So>. really <laughs> yes <laughs> so do you have any final question eric um i think we could maybe close this up by asking you florian um, what do you think are the most important skills that our students should acquire and learn if they want to be part of, say, the development of the next generation of wireless, which would then be mm. 6G, presumably? But I mean, yes. and speaking specifically of the air interface development here that we've been mm. focusing on today, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, uh, I do. So I, I think, um, um, well, as you, as you uh, saw from the discussion, the, um, um, the traditional uh, telecom um, uh, domain is, is, is merging more and more with the, with the classical uh, computer science domain and, and the cloud, uh, cloud computing domain. So um, st if, if, if students want to, um, um, want to make a contribution to, to, to next generation of standards, I think they, they need to be um, fluent in, in, in both skills. So they need to, uh, they need to know how to, how to, um, you know, use uh, cloud-based technologies like like containers, and and uh, things like that. And they also need to understand, um, um, you know, networking technology and 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 skills of of modulation and coding and 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 the different layers of the of the of the communication system. So I I think that's very important. Um, and of course, if you want to work with open interface, um, you also need, of course, uh, good good coding skills. Yeah? I mean, as I said, everything is written in in C, and it's quite um, um, some of the functionalities are quite um, um, how should I say um, make uh, a lot, use a lot of point arithmetic and and you know uh, very. Um, um, deep Lots of hacks deep, and tricks exactly. to make deep technology. <laughs> so you need to be fluent yes. in, in in these programming languages right, to, right. To, to make a contribution to open mm, interface. Mm, mm. So basically everything spanning from the basic, <laughs> let's say, math and physics yeah. and up to programming in the cloud. Yeah, there's a lot of knowledge indeed that um, yes. the next generation engineers have to acquire. Um, yes. Yeah, so... Uh, is there anything else you would like to take the opportunity to, to say to our listeners while you're here? Well, there's just one thing I want to mention. I mean, the, I mean, keep in mind that uh, that Open Interface is a, is a big uh, team effort. Um, so I have been with it for 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 quite a long time, but it was not me who founded it. It was my colleagues uh, Raymond Knopp and Christian Bonnet who, who founded this. And of course, there were a lot of people along the way um, who who helped uh, who helped developing this. Um, I mean, the community is really large, and and today, and and I, basically, I would like to thank all of them um, who have made a contribution to to Open Interface, and uh, of course, all the all the members uh, that um, that financially support uh, the Open Interface uh, Software Alliance that allows us to, you know, keep up the good work and and uh, assure the quality of the of of the code. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for, for joining us for this uh, discussion. And it's really exciting to see how, how big and successful and, uh, an open uh, project like this can be. Indeed, very inspiring. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you, Emil. It has been a pleasure. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And see you in the next episode. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.